Hello and welcome to the Promised Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett as per usual. We're back ahead of Bournemouth away. Bournemouth mm. absolutely stuffed Man United at Old Trafford earlier in the season. I remember and, uh, I was there. It was, yeah, uh, will the same thing happen this weekend? We're not going to talk too much about that match though today because we feel like, from my perspective anyway, the football is kind of a... United are out with a top four, top five race. Mm. It's kind of a sideshow now to the long-term planning. So I think that's the way that we're going to maybe take today's show. Uh, how interesting is the Bournemouth game for you, Rob? Not massively. I don't want to sound disrespectful there because I still think the football is the most important thing in, in what we do in our jobs and, and obviously in the game itself. But I agree with you. I think the kind of long game here is is more is more what's interesting with Man United. You know, how do we end this season? What we're going to do? You know, does winning a few games now really help you? Well, that's still the idea, isn't it? So you still win football matches. You got the FA Cup coming up. That's obviously United's last chance, really, of any silverware. But I think more than that, Scott, it's just it, it we're in limbo now. That's the word. You know, we're in kind of ten hog limbo. That's where we go now because we don't know this manager is going to be with us next season. There is kind of hints and digs that that's probably the case is that Ineos might go looking elsewhere. That's something we'll talk about a lot in the next few weeks coming up. Um, and ten hog's just got to do the best of what he's got, isn't he? You know, he's had injuries. He's still got injuries. There's still immense tactical problems on a football pitch for Manchester United. They can do some things well for 10 minutes and then look like they've never played together 10 minutes later. Um, that's going to be a continuing thing. I don't think we're suddenly just going to get a change in form now in the next few games. Yeah, Man United's running is Bournemouth away. FA Cup semi-final against Coventry City at Wembley next weekend. Then Sheffield United at home and Burnley at home. Two teams in the relegation zone mm. who are bound for the championship, you would think. Palace away, Arsenal home, Newcastle home, Brighton away, and then potentially an FA Cup final if they are to win. So that is the that's the run in. Four games really in the next uh or five games in the next few weeks that you would expect Man United to win on any given mm -hmm. day, but we all know it's not that simple. Uh but as we've said from the top, really with top United are eleven points away from top four and top five. And I think that is, I think that's gone. I think everybody knows that's gone. How low will United finish? How high will United finish? Who knows? Uh, but like we say, the longer term strategy and the longer term planning is really what is going to underpin or how good that is, is, is what's going to underpin United's success and the differential from where they are currently. There's new uh, PSR rules coming in, which United might benefit from. Uh, from next season, I think. It's not confirmed yet, but the Premier League voted yesterday that, on Thursday, that uh, teams will be able to spend up to 85% of their revenue. I think that's the way it's going to look on transfer fees, agent fees, and wages. And that would give United a lot more room for manoeuvre. Cha-ching uh, for United, that is. Cha-ching. It's, it's almost a, like they wrote that rule. <laughs> yeah, it was unanimous, unanimously voted for. I don't know the, the, yeah. the ins and outs of how that's going to look yet, but they, I think they vote on it in June uh, to actually bring it into play, but I think it's a formality by this point. So that should mean that United and a few other select teams benefit from, from that because United's revenue is, even in the face of their terrible on-pitch on uh, fortunes at the moment, the revenue is still pretty strong. Yeah, and for seventy five percent of the Premier League, revenues are really strong. So, like, I think this is the whole. This is why they voted for it unanimously because it's only really the team squad that maybe come up that have a lower revenue base or a lower fan base that struggle with that that rule. Whereas I think I don't know. Even if you go to a, a Bournemouth or a Brighton, you know, like teams that are traditionally from smaller territories, that the, the revenues are healthy. Do you know what I mean? So it means that they can also go and spend more like an Aston Villa, you know, so that there's, there's other teams that are kind of in that mid bracket where they're trying to get in the top four or in the top six. And it, and it kind of benefits them all. But as you said, it benefits teams like Man United and now Man City, who Man City, obviously incredibly strong revenues over the last five years. Um, they'll be able to take advantage of this and it will stop them from getting these points deductions. Cause this is why they're changing this rule because they, they want to avoid, these sporting sanctions, that's the truth. 
and obviously United's wiggle room on on that kind of thing moving forward will be ben- will be better and stronger if they can clear their wage bill. And we'll talk about Rafa Varane a little bit on today's show. We'll talk about all the well. United need to clear out, don't they? Anthony Martial is going to leave 250 grand a week off the mm. wage bill. Rafa Varane likely to leave. We'll talk about that later in the show. Casemiro potentially leaving. Christian Eriksen potentially leaving. Lots of players wrong oh, side of 30 or on mm. around about 30 who are maybe not going to fetch loads of money in transfer fees. Maybe they leave on free transfers, but the wiggle room that would create for whatever United's new team off the pitch looks like. That will be beneficial and helpful. But uh, before we get into the running order of today's show, subscribe to it. Our audio is on Apple and Spotify and give us a five-star review on there. Please find us, The Promised Land, a Manchester United podcast. If you have not subscribed already, five-star reviews, etc., etc. Watch us on YouTube as well. You can like the stream, subscribe, leave a comment and hit the notification bell. So you never miss a show as well. And follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders on X, Instagram, and TikTok, at underscore Rob, underscore B on X, and YouTube, and at TPL, MUFC, on X as well. Now, the running order today, what we're going to talk about, John Murta is leaving. Was that bye, Tuesday John. or Wednesday? But J- John Murta is leaving. Yes, uh, the longer This bye. week-ish, I think. Mm. And uh, his duties will be assumed by other people who are currently in the club. But off the, off the back of that, so Jim Ratcliffe has held face-to-face talks with Amanda Staveley over Dan Ashworth. We'll talk about that. They want to get that one moving. Uh, there's still stalemate at the moment over the compensation package. We'll talk about, as I mentioned, Rafa Varane and Willy Cambuala, who could potentially get a run in the team with all of the defensive injuries and the players who are absent. Johnny Evans is absent. Rafa Varane is absent. Lisandro Martinez is absent, all for relatively long-term uh, against how much, how long's left of the season? There's like mm-hmm. six weeks left, ish. Yeah, six weeks left of the season. God, I think crazy. Evans is closer. Evans is a lot closer than Varane. But Johnny Evans playing. Do you want? Do you really want to play a 36 year old for the rest of I the don't. season? No, no, not, <laughs> not at all. Johnny Evans getting a nice send off would be nice if he's. Ken Hog be... might want to do that, <laughs> but mm. I, I'm not sure I do. Uh, but yes, uh, Willie Cambuala, who played well against Liverpool. Yeah. Should get a run in the team. And then we'll talk about a player who's joined first team training this week. And some accounts on social media have been going crazy over this. Mm-hmm. Uh, he does not look his age. <laughs> uh, but Shay Lacey, we'll talk about him because United's. Uh, if there's one thing United are doing well at the moment, it's their academy. And uh, it's among the best in the country at the moment. Yes. They have already brought through, under Eric Ten Hag, brought through. Two players, maybe three now, if you can include Cambuala in this. Two players, three players into first team action. Two of them are regulars, start pretty much every match. Mm-hmm. Harry Amas has joined uh, training over the last few weeks in, in the wake of problems at left back. Mm-hmm. Shay Lacey, could he be next? We've been talking, we've mentioned him a couple of times, but we have. Yeah. If you watch his highlights, he reminds you. This is a big comparison to make, and it's not me saying or Rob saying that he's going to be as good as this player. Lionel but Messi. He just, yes. He just looks <laughs> he looks like Phil Foden when he has he the ball. He does a bit. Foden is right winger. Mm. Uh, could be getting maybe you'll see maybe see him get a sniff of first team football at the end of the season. I hope so. Yeah, I really do. So we'll come to that later. John Murta to start with. Officially announced as departing Man United, there was some talk over whether a new role would be found for him. He was, what was his title? It was along the lines of director of football or football football director, I think it was, wasn't it? I think I think I think Darren Fletcher is the football director. That's I think Darren Fletcher's role, which he will not be much longer. But it was more a kind of overseeing. I don't even. It, it was a directorship, but it it, it, it wasn't football. Director. Darren Fletcher was technical director. I, th- I think I 
well, I think the thing is that they gave Darren Fletcher just some rogue title, and it was a bit like, well, I know they're just trying to give him a job here, but John, obviously... John Murta, football director, right? So, what was, oh, right, so, so I think Fletcher, they're trying, they're they're talking about retaining him as well potentially, but I don't think there was ever a chance here of John Murto staying. In. Like we've said, when he's been in the stands, it's been quite obvious, isn't it? Ineos all sat in a row together, and John Murto sat one or two rows behind. <laughs> he wasn't exactly in the conversation during games or while they're chatting away about what they're watching um but inevitable scott i think this is again when you look at the restructuring of manchester united richard arnold was the first full guy and the correct one to go i think john murto is the right one here to to exit as well he hasn't been a complete bust in terms of maybe the organization behind manchester united with the youth team as you said there and don't really think he has overly too much input into that but he was the guy that united sent out to go and do some negotiations and stuff and so that's that's something that's a change because he was the guy that would get shipped off to Barcelona or somewhere to go and have a chat with someone and get photographed and waved to the cameras and then uh and then disappear from view. So um the, the that right might be the lasting image though of, of him and Richard Arnold. There's there's the one of the Richard cafe. Arnold where he go where he goes to a pub yeah. and speaks to fans, which <laughs> at the time was uh, an interesting move. That wasn't it? Uh but mm. then there's those images from two summers ago of John Murta and Richard Arnold standing on the streets in Barcelona trying to get a deal for Frankie de Jong over the line. It took them seven weeks, yeah. 12, 12 weeks even. It was about 12 weeks, wasn't it? It took them about 12 weeks and then they failed. Well, and it's two years Gatineau. still. Now. Yeah. <laughs> they still didn't get there. Yeah. Uh, and Murta madness is ending. That was a, a Twitter favorite term. Yeah, Murto yeah. madness, mundane Murto in my head because again he, he had an opportunity to do something in Scotland Football Club. You know, I think actually those at the top of the tree in the executive with Manchester United, I'm talking about Richard Arnold and, and Murto, kind of ran the ship for a long time. The Glazers not really interested in any of that stuff and kind of let them get on with it because they were their guys. So I think this is again this a natural progression here towards the new structure which we you know we know all about it's like it's it's quite funny scott the reports about dan ashworth and it seems to get reported every day like oh it's new something new's happened and it's like it's been the ongoing process for weeks and weeks and weeks um of course we have got something extra to talk about today because of uh united's talks with newcastle but i think with john murto you know good luck to him i don't think he ever really did the job to the standard that we needed but then again there's a lot of people at manchester united in the last 10 years who who have fallen foul of that. And, you know, Murta came from Everton and came actually with David Moyes. So he's been at a club a long time. And, uh, and it's time to kind of out with the old and in with the new. Yeah, he's... Uh, it's been a long time coming, to be fair. Like, like we talked about with Darren Fletcher, he will get some kind of new role which may link the academy to the first team. And, yeah, you know... I think it, for anything, the fact that he he has been in that role, there's very few things that have worked at United over the last few years. But when you look at the the way that they've mapped uh, players' paths to the first team, mm. I think that's gone quite well. Uh, and I think Darren Fletcher plays an important part in that when he's, especially when he's spoken out. I think he did a, a bit with Rio Ferdinand and Johnny Evans a few weeks ago when Rio asked him, "What what's your job?" <laughs> and I think he he talked about that. But obviously, with the uh, the theme of today's show is being you know, especially around like Shea Lacey, this kind of thing is being who who's next to break in. Obviously, we've, mm. we talked about Kobe Menu enough. We talked about Kobe Menu before he was even in the first team as well. We did the same thing with Garnacho. Harry Amass, we haven't gone into too much detail on really, I don't think, but he's on the fringes and he's a similar age to Shea Lacey as well. And uh, if they can continue that path of progression through Darren Fletcher and whoever else is coming in, then you might find again that United at some point in the near future have half of their first team, <laughs> you know, with Academy prospects in it. Yeah. And I think with, with Fletch, the whole thing is, is that, you know, it kind of come in in this role to, to be part of the development and to help around what I don't want to see Scott is Darren Fletcher warming up the team before games. Cause that's what I see. I'm there at game, I'm at games. I see it. I don't want Darren Fletcher doing that. It's not his job. He's not a coach. So if he's going to be a coach and that's what his job is, fine, do it. But I don't want anyone in kind of 
technical aspect to the planning side of it to be doing that. I want them to be more savvy. I want them to be the more desk based people to be able to talk about things and to put a, a kind of a project together. I, I think the thing with Darren Fletcher, Scott, is that he he's an intelligent guy. Right, he's a clever guy. He isn't your normal average footballer. He's he's got something up here. Fergie's always talked about that as well, about how intelligent he is and how he he's a he's a thinker and a, and and can and is expansive. So if he's part of that, Scott, and part of a new generation at Man United, that's great. But at the same time, I'm not that worried about it. If he stays great, if he goes fine, I just think you have to now get all the pieces in the right place so you can make a run now in the next two or three years. So, big thanks to John Murta, who came in, as Rob mentions, with David Moyes in a variety of different jobs. And Brian Robson this week said um, something along <laughs> the lines of, I, yeah, I, I, I essentially screwed up on uh, the signing of Jude Bellingham. I didn't do my job properly. Or so. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. paraphrasing him there, but that, that's essentially what he said. And if you look into like detailed reports of how that day went, the fingers essentially pointed at John Murta a little bit for taking it in a direction maybe that he shouldn't have yes uh, well we, we heard at the time that you know you heard this in football all the time done deal done deal bellingham's done no doubt about it come to united united have absolutely put the red carpet out for him was it like fergie's there eric Cantona's there brian robson's there it's like this this kid we've got him you know we, we're gonna get him and he went blah 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 blah, blah. first team football first team football that conversation got bypassed and he went to Dortmund <clears throat> because Dortmund went, we'll play you. <laughs> it's kind of as simple as that. Whereas I think when I did a show on it at the time, I was like, even if we sign Bellingham tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised at 17 if he just sits on our bench for two years because that's how it felt at that time. Do you know what I mean? Like, didn't feel United were ready for a talent like Bellingham at that point. Just looked like he'd be a development project. And of course, Jude Bellingham doesn't want that. Not interested. So yeah, Robbo did say that and and kind of mentioned Murta as well that, that they failed because they they honestly thought they'd done their jobs and maybe it shows in the modern game scott that you have to talk to young footballers a little bit differently about what you give them and how you motivate them because it's not all old school anymore is it this is new school and you've got to be able to offer them something tangible quite often that is getting playing minutes and that's something that man united have to look at yes uh we'll move on though because the Times report that has uh, come out on, I think it was Thursday night, intimates that sources believe the announcement this week by United over Murta's stepping down is an indication that progress is being made via Jim Ratcliffe yes. on Dan Ashworth, who has mm -hmm. been, as we, we even said from, I think it was back in December we did this, that Dan Ashworth was wanted as the, the new sporting director or equivalent, whatever job title he's going to get. <clears throat> at United, Jim Ratcliffe has said he is the clearly one of the top sporting directors in the world. And this is, it's going to happen at some point. It's just a case of when, isn't it? But I think when Murta leaves and when Richard Arnold leaves, and now you've got Barada in, Jason Wilcox is waiting. I've seen Julian Ward being linked this week as well with the, with the um, head of recruitment role. Yep. And we talked about him before. Mm -hmm. I think it looks to me that United want to get this structure in place for the summer. Of course, of course. Like, if you're going to go into the transfer market, the savvy thing to do is that, this is why we said as well, the manager's position isn't actually the most important thing here. It's not like it was maybe two or three years ago. The most important thing here, Scott, is getting structure so you know where your pounds and penny are, are being spent and what your idea is. Because there's no doubt I think this administration is going to go out with an idea of what it wants to do. It's going to build a squad in the next year or two, as you just said there with the kind of, change in ffp and all of this that they're going to try and squeeze that for every penny to get what they want out of this and i think the things with dan ashworth we said this i think on the very first show we ever did about dan ashworth and there was always oh united are gonna to have to pay 20 million 30 million here we go mad money i was just like it doesn't work like that united will sit and wait till newcastle go and we have to hire someone else now so there you go and this is where we are now and i think the funny thing is that newcastle and the saudis have dug their heels in because it is a kind of little bit of a political game there. You know, they don't want to be seen to be weak. Um, there's no need for them to be weak. And of course, Dan Ashworth is sat at home gardening. The weather's getting better now, Scott. I've been doing a bit of gardening, been out there because now it's a, bit, it's a bit more sunny. Dan Ashworth's thinking, 
well, I'll just turn up at Old Trafford when they sort it all out. I've got nothing else to do now. So Dan Ash was obviously already having a big say at Man United. This is this is how I look at it. Even uh, Omar Barada's not officially in the job. But they're all working towards the same goal. So there'll be plenty of discussions behind the scenes. So, yeah, so Jim now, his idea is to get, obviously get to Newcastle, as he did this week, and to, to argue the toss and to get his guy out of the football club so he can then hire him. And it... It is as done deal as you could possibly get, I think, in terms of the sporting directorship. Like you say, Newcastle need to move on themselves. What are they going to do? Just happily just sit there paying him while they wait yeah. for United to not pay the full compensation that they want, <laughs> you know, yeah. and... No, that's not. It's just not going to happen, is it? Get a grip. Like I think the thing is, is like had United gone for Dougie Friedman at Crystal Palace, you might have been able to go to Steve Parrish's office and, and negotiate something quite quickly because 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 it's Crystal Palace. But Newcastle want to be bigger players, and they are in terms of money, richest club in the world. So they don't have to do things exactly how other teams might. But I also think Scott and Man United are not trying to strong arm this. They're just being quite calm about it, and I like that. You know, they're being professional. They're like, okay. He's on gardening leave. He is going to leave that football club quite quickly because you also need a director of football. So you can't continue in that vein. We've seen in Newcastle this year, Scott, with injuries and whatever. That manager now is at risk because obviously their league position. So they might be pressing a reset button in a few weeks' time. Do you know what I mean? So let's see where that goes. But I, I, look, it is a done deal. Everything, everyone behind the scenes is very, very calm and, and you just feel like they've got their guy. You say done deal. It's not conversation is not done but you know, I, I, I not don't cool. think there's, there, there's no chance that the conversation is going to go oh do you know what Dan's decided to stay at Newcastle it's not happening it's done that's not no, he's not going back to Newcastle he might have to sit on his hands for a while like if they can't agree a deal um, but again this is what I said before these, these people still carry on doing their jobs they have the conversations and their conference calls and whatever and the little whispers <laughs> and run their football clubs. That's how they do it. So I think the thing is with United, as you said, John Murto being not shown the door, but maybe the timing of it, because they could have waited till the summer, couldn't they, with Murto? Could have just said to Murto, wait till the summer. You know, we'd have to, we'd have to talk about it. They've uh, He's gone out the door now. I do think there's some kind of correlation there in terms of the hires <laughs> that uh, maybe John Murto's time is done and someone else is coming in to do the job. If you're not, I can get them all in. When, when was Barada starting? Was it June 1st or July 1st? I can't remember. Yeah, some, some of the normal contracts start on June 1st, don't they? Football contracts. Uh, J- July 1st is when oh, the July 1st, start. sorry, yes. I yes, think yes. Barada was uh, July, uh, June 1st, I think it was. Yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll look at that as we as we uh, as we continue to discuss. But whatever whatever the makeup of this, whenever it's in, whenever this structure is in, Ashworth, uh, Barada, Jason Wilcox, recruitment or head of recruitment, whoever that is, because I think United want that as well. And there'll probably be some other switch ups as well. Manager, whoever that is, although the manager won't. I know Ten Hag is in uh, talks at the moment about like next season, et cetera, et cetera. And you should really include the manager in that, but the manager is not going to be the guy who is making all the decisions. And I think the decision on who the manager is will come down to that team. Dan Ashworth, probably Berardo will have a say, but the, the, the word is that they want to pass all of that control over who the manager is to Dan Ashworth. And that's why the Graham Potter links are coming up. Mm. Obviously they just won't go away, but they will also have to preside over <coughs> correcting the wage bill mm. and ensuring that there is a path to the first team. Like we've talked, talked about with Darren Fletcher a path to the first team for academy players and making sure that United spend their money more responsibly than they have for the last decade plus. Yes. And as much as Raphael Varane, you could argue that he's had a good enough spell at United, but I tweeted it yesterday. Real Madrid know when to sell players and Real Madrid absolutely mugged off United for about 100 <laughs> million time. quid. 100 million quid. And I think everybody knew it at the time as well for Rafa Varane. Maybe it was short of 100 million. It was like 35, 40-ish, wasn't it? And then for, uh, Casemiro was 60 million. But that's two yeah. players who they got multiple Champions Leagues out of that they... Obviously, it was a little bit of a surprise that they sold them both at the same time. But you, when you're a big club and you want to sell a player, you want to do it at that point where 
the football world in general still considers them at their peak, but you know, who see them every day in training, who see their maybe drop off in some of their levels, like, ah, maybe it might be the right time to cash in and just go and sign some younger players. And yeah, obviously, Real Madrid didn't plunge all the money in that they, um, you know, the, they, the money they received from United isn't directly responsible for their, their new look midfield of uh, Jude Bellingham, Chuamani, uh, Camavinga, who we we talked about on the show, Camavinga as well, didn't we? Yeah. I think he picked, picked them up for 25 mil. But that definitely helps. Definitely helps their bank balance. And that is the difference. Real Madrid are currently top of La Liga. I know that Man City may knock them out of the Champions League next week. But Real Madrid are one of the most famous clubs in the world, as Man United are. And those two deals, Casemiro and Varane, reflects the difference between how well Real Madrid have been managed over the last few years without Premier League money versus Man United, who have willingly given them 100 million quid just because they were big names who've won a few Champions Leagues. Real Madrid have now moved on to a new era. They will sign Kylian Mbappe, they'll get Endrick, and they will be fine. For a number of years, United have to play catch up in the meanwhile, and they've given Madrid a hundred million quid in the process. So, and yeah, and that's from sorry. the guy that invented the Galactico model, you know, with with, with uh, Florentino Perez. Is that you know he spent years going around buying the David Beckham's of the world and the Zidane's and everyone he could get his hands on and building this Galactico model, and then has realised through his advice that's been given to him at his football club over the last few years, is that at some point you have to move away from it. You have to. You have to build intelligently and organically and that still means spending money scott but it means as you said like i said about being a bit more frugal and about spending it in the right places getting casemiro and varan out of real madrid seemed like a huge victory for manchester united didn't it it's like oh here we are we've tempted these players i think the big thing was when varan arrived because varan arrived the year before didn't he did Varane arrive under Ole? Yeah, he did, didn't he? So Varane arrived, and you needed a centre-back. So you're looking at it, you're going, oh, well, we, we need a Varane-type player, so that's good. We've actually got the model there in Varane. And when you looked at Casemiro, it's a similar, wasn't it? It's kind of like knee-jerk reaction. You need a number six. Oh, look, Casemiro is the, inverted commas, best number six in the world. That was the kind of thing thrown around all the time. Problem is, Scott, they're both getting on. They're both ageing. And now you're at this point where at the back end of their deals – you kind of know they're not going to be as good as maybe the plays you signed because they get injuries, you get knocks, and the Premier League is totally unforgiving on old bodies. It really is not in a way that maybe La Liga and Serie A are not. You know, all the players can play on there and carry on. I saw Modric the other day come on a football pitch, you know, jogging around. He can still do it off the bench. So I think when you look at Real Madrid, Scott, that's actually the model to copy now. You need to go and find your Camavingas, your Tuamanis. You've got to go and find your Bellingham somewhere, which is a lot harder. But you've got to build it organically from the bottom up. And that means getting those wages off because the players that you mentioned at the top of the show, Casemiro, Varane, who else did you mention? Ericsson. There was one Martial. other. Who was it? Yes, we, we all forget about Martial, but he is still there. Martial, yeah. That's overall, that's 50 million pound of wages a year for those four players. 50 million. That is a huge chunk of your wage bill. Now, if you took that 50 million off, you can divide that into multiple players. You can do, especially young players, really, really quickly. You can go find your Garnachos. You can go hunting. You can actually go get these kind of that bracket of 18 to 21 year old. That's what United have got to do, Scott. That's the way you've got to do it now. You've got to do it. You've got to go with youth. Youth is the way forward. And and just supplement it with experienced players. But we've seen it this year. Like the Amrabat experiment hasn't worked, has it? You know, you haven't got, you've gone that route. You tried it. It doesn't work. The manager doesn't like it. And Man United have lost lots of games. So you've had the opportunity to try things this year. I don't think any of those things have worked, except Manu and Garnacho. I think they're the only two that you can look at at the end of the season. If the season finished tomorrow, I think we'd all go, those two guys probably are players of the year and they're kids. So maybe the the pathway is already built there for Man United, Scott. I think any of us might look at this and go, okay, that's the bit that works at our football club. Let's push that forward. Let's talk about Rafa Varane just more in depth, a bit briefly, yeah. because he, as you say, I think he arrived in 2021. Lots of fanfare. It was a nice moment. It really was. Like for yeah. they presented both of the players on the pitch, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, and Casemiro was just me. before the Liverpool like win. That in I think the Stratford end. Yeah. Obviously, big stars. They've won a lot of Champions Leagues. They've won a lot of trophies. And 
classic to the United Way over the last 12 years. Here's a big star. Azang. Hey, look, let's enjoy let's enjoy this person for a year mm. <laughs> or two. And I, I know there's a there's a conversation going on about Varan and saying, you know, Varan's actually been present for a lot of minutes, and you know, there's a lot of defenders who are actually less available than Rafa Varan is. Mm. That that's actually a thing that I've seen. But when you're on as much money as he is, it'd be different if he was like Johnny Evans levels right if he was like on a wage like johnny evans was and you could bring him in for experience and that's the like I look, i'm even i've said this recently kevin de bruyne at man city is now reaching that age where you have to manage his minutes yeah and he can't play at 65 games a season mm -hmm. because he, he physically can't do it he's suffering a lot of injuries and missed a lot of time this season and when you get to he's he's 30 ish 30, is he de bruyne's older than that isn't he he might be older than that now. 32? 32? I think so. He's getting on. He looks younger than me. He's actually 33 going into next 33. season. Yeah, I thought I, so. I yeah, really yeah. underestimated how, uh, yeah, yeah, how yeah. he's finished. Hey, do you know what? He's finished. I said it. I think I said it on our show six months ago. I went, Man City will move De Bruyne on because they're ruthless. Not because they don't like De Bruyne. They'll look at De Bruyne and go, you're a high wage earner. You know, you're you're now in and out the team and Phil Foden is God. So we don't need you anymore. Thanks a lot, mate. Off you go. <laughs> that's how it will be. Because that's how you have to be, isn't it? I think with, with high wage earners is that they've got to give you They've got to give you value for money if you're going to pay those big dollars. But yeah, you're right about Varane, totally. So obviously, Varane, there's been chat about trying to justify whether to extend his contract. He's up, his contract's up at the end of this season. There is a year's worth of extension option in it on the same wages as currently. Mm -hmm. United are not taking up that option. If Good. they are to extend, there's been talk about a pay, pay to play deal or reduced wages. He's not going to do that, is he? But is he going to do that? No, no. I think it, it, by by this point, I think there's options in Saudi Arabia for him to go and earn an absolute wedge of money in the final years of his career. I think that's probably the most likely way it's going to go, unless he decides to go back to somewhere like Lons or or something. I think I that's going to France. I think, I think you know like, he's been he's been out of the homeland for for a very very long time. He's played Disney outside of of France, and and I think the thing is Scott is that he he talked recently, and and Casemiro has talked about this as well, just off the cuff about about Saudi Arabia and all this. And I actually think that where we were at the the peak of Saudi maybe a year ago is not as kind of players are looking at it and then there's lots of stories going around and coming back out with agents and agents are a little bit now a little bit more hesitant they're going don't like the setup there it's not quite working for our players our players are not happy our players want to come out so i think there's actually maybe 12 months ago you could have could have moved those players on quite easily to Saudi just simply because of the money i think the things of ryan scott and you just got to be absolutely ruthless about this year rafa varan when he is fit is still a very good footballer when he is fit again, adverted commas, and he's been more fit this year than not. So we can't really moan too much about that. But you know that he can break down at any moment, and because of that, you got to get that player at your football club. That's how it is. Someone who's a bit younger, say Luke Shaw, similar situation. But Luke Shaw's got some more years in front of him, so you might go, well, we'll, we'll persist with that, try and work with the player. But what are you doing with Rafa Varane? You know what are you doing with Casemiro? You know these players are not the future. You know this. So do it now. Get them out of the football club, pay them up, get them out, sell them, and then bring in the kids and bring in other players that you can rotate in and out of those positions. I don't think Varane's been bad at all this year, Scott, but I think he is part of the wider dysfunction at Man United is that these players are on inflated wages and they don't give you enough wins in a season. And it's just as simple as that. Nothing personal to Rafa. Nice to see him at Man United in this little spell that he's been at the football club. But I think someone tweeted you, Scott, to that tweet and said, oh, you know, we've got value out of Varane, you know, because he's played 100 games. If you work that out, he's probably got paid about a million pounds a game. It's not value. It's rubbish. Mm. Yeah, it's not value at all. That's 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 crass. You know, you're supposed to play players one, two hundred thousand pound a week and they play one game a week. That's how it works. But if you pay a million pounds for each game, then that's stupid. So you've got to send these players out. So... Yeah, you know, that's. I think that's where I stand with it with Varane. I think some people are like keep Varane, let Maguire go. 
think this season, to me, he's told me the other way around. I'm like, I'd rather extend Maguire. <laughs> and because of the leadership he's given, actually, his form has been better than Varane at times. So I know Varane's played well recently, but no. Sit Varane now, play Camboala. You've got the opportunity to maybe, you know, spin the dial a little bit now, spin the bottle and find a better way. And, and I think that's it for Varane. I don't think we'll see him. We might never see him play for United against Scott because they're saying that he might not be back for the end of the season, but we'll see how that goes. I don't know. I, th I think we will before the end, but the, the point remains you've got to move on. And when, yeah, if you're not know, competing for top four, I would, I would look at this differently and I would say, okay, get him back and then let's get him in as yeah. soon as possible. But they're so far off. They're going to finish at maximum sixth, potentially lower. But then mm. if, if they perform as, or if they get the results over the next four games that you would A, expect and B, hope with the run of games that they've got, you know, maybe they will end up finishing sixth and playing Europa League football next season. I've seen suggestions this week from different media that if there's a way that Man United can finish sixth and then still end up in the Champions League. Not <laughs> honestly, honestly. Sell those um, newspapers. It's ridiculous. Anyway. <clears throat> So United are sixth at the moment. They have an FA Cup semi-final and a potentially FA Cup final and then seven games left in the Premier League, I think it is. Yeah. Against teams that you would expect them to beat. What's the what's the harm giving Willy Camboala an extended run? You know, it'd be different if Martinez is there, but obviously he could be out for another month or however long it is. I, I'm not sure the exact... Uh, time frame on on his return but mm. when you think of johnny evans yeah he's been he's been good like way better than anybody would have ever expected play way more minutes than anybody would have ever expected you want him if he's going to leave you want him to get a nice send off at some point you want him to play again and you can say goodbye to the old traffic crowd properly whenever that is but is he going to be a long-term option no like now is your testing ground for players like willie Camboala. Maybe even Harry Amass and maybe even Shea Lacey before the end of the season. You can have a look at them. Remember when it was Josh Harrop, wasn't it? <laughs> Remember Josh Harrop came in and scored on the final day of the season against Crystal Palace? Oh, was it as well? And, and was it Wilson as well came in? James Wilson. James Wilson, next yeah. big thing. He was going to be huge, yeah. wasn't he? James Wilson scored on his debut at the end. Of, that was under Ryan Giggs, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, but Turns so, yeah, out they was wasn't. Good. Turns out yeah. they weren't the next big thing, right? But I think there's more hope in the players that were not like Shea Lacey, Harry Amass. There's a lot more hope, I think, that they will be longer term stays. Yeah. But with the likes of Camboala, you know, played really well against Liverpool. <clears throat> You've got to use this extended period of time, like next six weeks or so, really. Not, I'm not saying play him, play him in every game, but give him a chance. Mm. Give him a shot to see if he can hack it. And that is a better option, really. Because your aspirations of finishing in the top four are gone. Maybe maybe they're not saying that internally, but realistically, look at it. It's a better option if you take the line of what we said at the top of the show, which is that you have to look, think just long term now. You can't, like, short termisms don't really matter. But we're still in this vortex of Ten Hag. So if Ten Hag is going to stay long term and he's been given guarantees by his boss then you can maybe spin the wheel a little bit and play the kids. I don't think he's going to do that, Scott. Like We know what Ten Hag does. As I said, I described him as a conservative because I think he has a very set methodology. Uh, I don't think he's going to be thinking, oh, yeah, let's just play the kids and see how the season pans out. I think he's going to be like, I need to win as many games as possible. And guess what? I'm going to play counter-press, and it's going to be chaotic, and we're going to do what we've been doing for the last six months. <laughs> so I, I would like to see something that's building towards next season already. I'm not quite sure we're at that point. You might get there, Scott. If the manager lost his job and you had an interim, then you might be able to go, right, let's just throw away the playbook and do something completely different. I think we'll see more of the same. But yeah, I think Camboala, I think he's kind of earned his minutes. Like you just talked about Johnny Evans there, Scott. I think Johnny Evans, like, like, thank God we have had him this year. <laughs> like, that's what I will say. You imagine if we didn't give Evans that year contract, you know, United would have been in real trouble at centre back. But you don't want Johnny Evans to be paying 20 odd games in a season, 25 games. He's there to play six. So 
I think again with Kambala is that you you now got to get on that horse. It's time now. Like you've got to give him minutes and find a way because Varane is going to be the next one out the door. I think. And even if you triggered Varane, Scott, and Varane did stay, say, for next year, I still wouldn't have Varane as first choice. I'd still be playing Kambuala. I'd be saying, sorry, Rafa, you're going to have to sit the stands this week. So there's all of that. And there's the balance with the money and all of those things. But I think with Kambuala, I think you saw at Liverpool, it's just a short cameo. But give him the rest of the games. You know, just play him and Maguire. I think they're your two best centre-backs when fit at the moment. And, and, you, and you work with that till the end of the season. What is it about him you like? I like it. Like, all right, let's do it. Let's go thing. He's six foot four, just under six foot four, a smidgen. Yeah. He's athletic. He's quick. He's technical. He's progressive. He really likes to play with the space in front of him, yet he can still play coverage. And that's a unique thing with defenders now. You look at players like Saliba, that this is this is the kind of um the genetic pool you're kind of going for about how you want your centre backs to be, is that you want them to kind of be able to do stuff on the ball, but you also still want the defensive qualities there, don't you? And I think with Kambuala, that's what you're developing now at his age group, is that he needs to play games to get looks at good strikers. What do good strikers do at this level so I can learn? What have Everton done this year with Bramthwaite Scott? Yeah, they've stuck with it because they've had to, but he's had a whole season under his belt of playing against the best in the Premier League. Mixed results. Some games he's been outstanding. Other games he's got wrecked in some of those but most of the kind of opinion is that this boy's got something because we've seen it we've watched it and that's the thing with Campbell and our Scott is that he's got the technical and the physical aspects but he needs some experience in there now so play him because if you don't play him then the option has to be that you loan him you go out somewhere next year on loan and that you get him 40 50 60 games under his belt or you keep him at United Scott and he's part of your rotation and and I'm kind of happy with Eva, really. But I think we're at that point now with the injuries, one thing or another at the end of the season. There's a little window that's opened here for him is that you can play him and you can do it. A lot of people were worried before the Liverpool game and saying to me, oh, this kid, you know, it's Liverpool. This is going to be horrible. And I was like, no, he's known for having a good attitude. He's really, he's a leader. He's got leadership qualities. You know, he's, he's very, in, he knows what he can do in himself. I think we saw that against Liverpool. So he just went out there and tried to do his job. And that's all I ask Scott is to go out there and try and do the best. We'll see. I think he will play surely and unless, uh, but they, they released uh, updates on the fitness of Varane and Evans yesterday. I think they're both missing yeah. some time at least. I think they're definitely missing the Bournemouth game. Evans uh, is a week, I think, only. But I've, but they said they said potentially three to four weeks for for uh, for Varane because he's got a thigh, uh, a recurring thigh injury. Well, that's not good, is it? <laughs> recurring... No, that's one point. Like, no, <laughs> w- w- why flog him into the ground? Like, what? We'll drag him back. He can't run. Like you saw in the, with the game where he got he pulled up Scott in that game and and obviously had to go off. It's that you, you're kind of flogging him. He's trying his best, but his body's failing. So no point. Play a kid, sit him on the bench. Rafi, you still earn your money. Pout on the back. Thanks a lot. And then move on. Do you know what I mean? But yeah, I think Evans will come back. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if Evans does end up starting the final games because I think that's more likely what Ten Hag will do, Evans and Maguire. I think you've got to start taking some decisions that may not necessarily be completely popular with everybody. Because I know mm. Rafi Rand's a fan favourite, but, you know, it's not all about pleasing the fans is about running a successful business as well as, as grim as it sounds you've got to run your football club properly and i'm sure when man city sell bernardo silver this summer at some point that won't be the most popular decision and he's a fan uh, favorite because of what he's won at another club like come on it's not that he's got the acumen from being at man united and winning stuff so i think you can move on like comfortably do you know what i mean without it being a big deal but as you said there's a lot of fans that, that don't like that stuff and you know they like their favorites and one thing or another Remember, please subscribe to The Promised Land on audio on Apple and Spotify and give us a five-star review. Subscribe on YouTube as well. Like the stream, subscribe and leave a comment. And uh, we'll get in now to the newest potential prospect to break into Manchester United first team action because he's joined first team training this week. There's been pictures and there's a picture on the thumbnail of him. He looks about 10 years old, but he is in fact... 16, 17, how old is he? Is he He's only six years older than 10. <laughs> <laughs> Shay Lacey, 
has joined first team training. Mm. If you're not sure or you don't really follow youth team football all that much, you know, Rob and I talked about Garnacho and Kobe Menu and feel like there's a nut there's there was a lot of excitement about both of them. How would you compare the excitement levels on Shay Lacey to those guys? Comparable, very much so. Uh, uh, and again, I think back to Kobe when he was 15, 16. I think back to Garnacho when we saw him, especially in that run where he, he kind of got his first minutes and when United won the Youth Cup. I think when you look at these young talents and you see the ceiling is high, you've got to kind of manage it properly. But I think you can also get excited about it, Scott, because it's they're not that far away. We only got to look at Jude Bellingham, like when he was 17 to where he is now. It's not actually that long ago. And they can make these strides season to season. So, yeah, Shea Lacey now training with the first team, had a bit of a, a bad injury, was out for six months, but is now back in the frame, now fit again. Um, is he ready to start? No. But I think when you look at you know, prospects, say like Ahmad, and you look at Shea Lacey, I think Lacey is actually the one who's got the more rounded gifts and attributes, um, doing incredibly well with England youth, you know, made that step up. Um, and and it's just, he, do you know what he's got? He's the, he's the modern footballer. He's the modern forward. Yeah, I can play attacking midfield, can play all of the positions left and right can play winger, can come inside, play central midfield, can get the ball deep, can travel with the ball, can pass the ball, and all of it is about technical ability. And that is exactly what United have missed for 10 years, Scott, in their squad, is that not enough players with technical ability, like it would be Paul Pogba and everyone else who can't pass a football. So that would be a problem for many, many years, you're relying on one player. I think with Shea Lacey, he is close. Will we see him this year? I'm not sure. But I'm enthused that he's now with the first team. Like, as you said, he does look like he's 10. And, you know, he, he might even be as small as a 10-year-old <laughs> in some aspects. But um, I think the whole thing is, is that uh, he's gifted. He's gifted. And, and I remember seeing Foden at that age, at 15, 16. I remember seeing him and, and people talking about Foden at that time. And the comparisons in those days was Messi. You know, people were like, oh, he's got Messi-like qualities. Well, he's not Messi, is he? But... He became a very good footballer, Phil Foden, might now be top five, top ten player in the world at the moment. Um, can you develop Shay Lacey to be similar? Fingers crossed. There's a big maybe there. He's a good player. But if, if you watch him, and like mm. obviously if you spend any time watching United's uh, youth team fixtures, or if you spend any time watching, because I know the thing that kids do nowadays is compilations. Uh, yeah, kids. <laughs> I, I, said, I said the other day, uh, that obviously Ronaldinho was a kid that like um, was a player who caught everyone's imagination. He's one of the most favoured players of the the, the current generation uh, because of the skills and and that kind mm. of thing. But the way players are judged nowadays, if Ronaldinho was playing nowadays, he, he'd have all the skills and stuff. But people will be asking questions about his statistics and uh, about goals and assists and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> Pass completion rate. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why. I don't know why I don't know why I moved down that path. But if yeah. you look at um, if you look at Shea Lacey and just look at the way he carries the ball and the the way he drops a shoulder, the way he faints, the way he dribbles, the way he switches the ball between both feet, the way he uh, occupies space, and the way he picks the ball up, the way he starts dribbling, it does kind of look like a Phil Foden regen yeah. in terms of style. Anyway, I'm not saying he's going to emulate Phil Foden. <laughs> AI or Ronaldinho Foden. for that matter. I don't know why I just brought him up, but <laughs> Ronaldinho has been in the press because he's Barcelona PSG. So I think you've seen him, and it's just he was at the game the other day and was on the pitch and waving to people. So I think that's what it is. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what point I was trying to make there. I think I, uh, yeah, he's a baller, isn't he? I know what you mean. He's like a he's he's a bit like young Ronaldo, isn't it? It's like step overs and flicks and tricks, and it's more more probably akin to TikTok than actually winning football matches in the modern day. Yeah. So Shay Lacey on the verge. Well, he's he's in training. And if you just I would encourage you, if you haven't already done it, just to go and like look at his uh look at his compilations. That's what I was talking about. I was talking about compilations, wasn't I? And yes. how you can make any player look amazing through compilations. Like you yeah. can probably make look Nicholas Bentner look amazing or Bebe look look amazing through a compilation video nowadays in just <laughs> three minutes. because uh, that's the way it's judged. But you know, and that was the point I was trying to make, right? Yeah. Some players can look amazing through compilations, even though they actually weren't that effective and all that good. But 
what you will see in any compilation of Shay Lacey is you you'll see a what looks like a natural really he looks yeah. like a natural footballer Kobe Mainu looks like a natural footballer the way he carries himself the way he gets his head up and you know and all of this and you could kind of tell just through the the eye test is something that people say the the eye test tells you that this player is actually quite good and obviously Shay Lacey the, the challenges he will have and maybe Rob we, we talked about this I think before we started recording how like being big and imposing doesn't really matter. Maybe Foden is, um, he's not, he's not a big guy. Uh, and obviously that Barcelona team that ripped the, the world to shreds in 2009 through that era, they beat United twice in uh, Champions League finals in, in three years. You know, they weren't necessarily the biggest team, but technical ability and technical quality was the most important thing. I think the game has reverted to Arsenal, a team of giants, nowadays but they do have players who are nimble and small man city mm. are largely a team of giants but you can carry players who are maybe not necessarily that height and have that technical ability that that's the one concern i have hopefully he goes through a growth spurt <laughs> um maybe fills out a bit but obviously when you're 16 17 you hope that comes but uh, one of the criticisms of ahmad has been obviously is he physically capable to kind of deal with it mm. uh so that's the one thing I would look at and maybe that will hold him back until that does happen. Uh, but in terms of talent, you know, he's right there. Yeah. I, I, I'm personally not as worried about those things. Like again, I think Guy Nacho and Manu is a really good example. Like Manu, I think looks very natural in that midfield now, isn't it? Where it was only five minutes ago, the same things were being said about him is like, you know, physically, is he big enough? And I think the same with Guy Nacho being a forward, people were like, well, he's going to get bodied. And he has this year, like he's had times where fullbacks, have tried to bully him, but that's all part of the learning process for me. And I think the thing is with Shea Lacey, just making the comparisons over Manu, obviously very, very different player stylistically and with the position, but what they both do and what modern players do and youngsters and what they're trained to do is to create all of this space. When they get the ball, where do I get the ball? So it's about off-ball work, and he is really good at it. And that is, that's more important because if people don't get near you, Scott, it doesn't matter how big the opponent is. If they can't get anywhere near you and you're 10 yards off them, they're going to just be chasing the shadows, aren't they? And I think the thing is you still need some like physicality in your team, especially maybe in the defensive end there. But when you're looking at the attackers now, I think, you know, even the day of the big attacker is kind of gone. Like Haaland's there, Whelan's fairly big, but you start no, going on, down. Big. Huh? He's big. Who's that, Haaland? Hoyland and Hoyland's big, yeah. Hoyland, well, he's six foot, isn't he? So he's not, he's not like a giant. Six foot's a normal height, I think, in in modern society. But the whole thing is, is that the days of uh, of Peter Crouch heights are not a thing as much anymore. It's more about, I think, speed, talent, and technicality in 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 the forward positions. So I look at Shay Lacey, and I'm just like, yeah, the, you, you, you again. He's a right winger that inverts on his left foot that can play through midfield in all the positions. And you're kind of like, that's what you need in the modern game. Do you know what? That's what you wanted Sancho to be, really. You were buying Sancho to be your baller, to be able to Didn't ball even out. mention Sancho wages at the top of the show. Well, there you go. Another wage that if you could, you very easily get off your wage bill. So, uh, you know, and, and I would just rather that these these young lads get the contracts and the minutes and that you give them that that incentive to, to build their careers. I, I just think with Shea Lacey, there is something about him. There's no doubt about it. And it, and I felt the same when I saw Phil Foden in the early years at City with, looking at youth football. You knew really early on there was something about him. You just saw like the technicality and the way that the low centre of gravity, I always think of that with small players, like how do you utilise that? Because that low centre of gravity gets you away from the challenge quickly. Shay Lacey does that already for me. I watch him and he, he can ghost into the channel without anyone seeing him. It's just like being invisible. It's like a special power. And when you can do that as a young player, that's something I think Ahmed needs to learn. Like I think if Ahmed could be a more ghostly player and pick the ball up in other players, in other, other areas of the pitch, be able to run at teams, I think he'd get more minutes. You can see that Ten Hag's not as keen with, with Ahmed. But Shea Lacey is actually a kind of Ten Hag-like player. So next year, if, if the manager is still with us, Shea Lacey might fit what he's trying to do on that right-hand side. I think the point is whoever the manager is, the 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 structure above him, yeah, should be promoting that. Yeah. And you know, that, that's an important thing. It's it's part of United's tradition and history that they have successful mm. youth players who 
bridge the gap and come into the first team and make themselves mainstays. That's something that United do better than most clubs in the world. And Jay Lacey, Harry Amass, potentially, who's been maybe around the first team a little bit longer than Shea Lacey over the last few mm-hmm. weeks. Two players who maybe you'll see them before the end of the season. Maybe. Maybe not. Let's see. But yeah, it'd be nice to see them off the bench or or maybe if they we get more injuries that you just kind of go with it and roll the dice and get the kids in. Um, but, you know, I say the same thing every week and I've got like, you know, believe in the kids. Like, you, you, the blood in the kids, losing with kids is fine. But I don't really want to lose of all these players on two, three hundred thousand pound a week that, that you constantly question about whether they should be at the football club or not. The youngsters do deserve to be at the club. That's what I do know. And you, you need to kind of stick with them. So check him out. Check out Shay Lacey. Just uh, go pop onto YouTube or the socials and have a look at his compilations. Mm. <laughs> um, or try and watch the United Youth Team. They're pretty good. They um, are very good. Just it's, for, a, it's a very good class this year. Yeah, it's very good. Probably class, the best but... since ninety two, I would say. Best it's the best United youth class since since nineteen ninety two in terms of talent from top to bottom. Um, I'm not saying they're as good as the class of ninety two, of course not, but there were there's there's two, three or four players in there you already look at and you think actually they could be training with the first team next year. And, and I've not felt that in previous years when I've watched a youth team. There's there's always been one or two, but there's multiple multiple teams there, multiple players in there, and I actually think Scott as well. If you do, you know, move Ten Hag on, that that's important. That the next coach is someone who is focused on those things and can develop youth. You know, that's, again, where Graham Potter gets a bit of a tick because that's something that he's been well known for in the past, to be able to take young players and make them Premier League ready quite quickly. Yeah, let us know. Talk about anything that we have spoken about in the comments section. Get in touch with us on social media as well and we'll be back early next week so please subscribe to our audio show on apple and spotify and give us a five-star review as well watch us on youtube we can like the stream subscribe leave a comment and hit the notification bell so you don't miss a show as well follow us on social media at double underscore scott saunders at underscore rob underscore b and at tpl mufc on x as well we've talked about a variety of topics today avoided the bournemouth game but fingers crossed united can win somehow do you have any faith, not really, that they'll go and take any points? Open so. mind. That's the positive way of looking. I'm uh, open-minded. Let's see what these boys can do and let's see how they're going. As I said, I don't think Ten Hag has lost dressing room or anything like that. So I'm sure Ten Hag will give them some tactics and then our players will try and do those tactics. End of story. Let's see how it goes. Thanks for listening or for watching, everyone. Until next time, this has been the Promised Land podcast. Have a fantastic weekend, and uh, we'll see you next week to talk about whatever happens in Bournemouth and anything off the pitch that happens in between as well. Have a great weekend from Rob and myself, Scott. Until next time, see you soon.